chapter fifteen of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter fifteen a verdict on the jury as to the second inquest i promised as you may remember to tell something also but in serious truth if i saw a chance to escape it without skulking watch i would liefer be anywhere else almost except in a french prison after recording with much satisfaction our verdict upon bardie's brother which nearly all of us were certain that the little boy must be the coroner bade his second jury to view the bodies of the five young men these were in the great dark hall set as in a place of honour and poor young watkin left to mind them and very pale and ill he looked if you please sir they are all stretched out and i am not afraid of them he said to me as i went to console him father cannot look at them but mother and i are not afraid they are placed according to their ages face after face and foot after foot and i am sure they never meant it sir when they used to kick me out of bed and oftentimes i deserved it i thought much less of those five great corpses than of the gentle and loving boy who had girt up his heart to conquer fear and who tried to think evil of himself for the comforting of his brethren's souls but he nearly broke down when the jurymen came and i begged them to spare him the pain and trial of going before the coroner to identify the bodies which i could do as well as any one and to this they all agreed when we returned to the long oak parlour we found that the dignity of the house was maintained in a way which astonished us there had been some little refreshment before especially for his honour but now all these things were cleared away and the table was spread with a noble sight of glasses and bottles and silver implements fit for the mess of an admiral neither were these meant for show alone inasmuch as to make them useful there was water cold and water hot also lemons and sugar and nutmeg and a great black george of ale a row of pipes and a jar of tobacco also a middling keg of hollands and an anchor of old rum at first we could hardly believe our eyes knowing how poor and desolate both of food and furniture that old grange had always been but presently one of us happened to guess and hezekiah confirmed it that the lord of the manor had taken compassion upon his afflicted tenant and had furnished these things in a handsome manner from his own great house some five miles distant but in spite of the custom of the country i was for keeping away from it all upon so sad an occasion and one or two more were for holding aloof although they cast sheep's eyes at it however the crowner rubbed his hands and sat down at the top of the table and then the foreman sat down also and said that being so much upset he was half inclined to take a glass of something weak he was recommended if he felt like that whatever he did not to take it weak but to think of his wife and family for who could say what such a turn might lead to if neglected and this reflection had such weight that instead of mixing for himself he allowed a friend to mix for him the crowner said now gentlemen in the presence of such fearful trouble and heavy blows from providence no man has any right to give the rein to his own feelings it is his duty as a man to control his sad emotions and his duty as a family man to attend to his constitution with these words he lit a pipe and poured himself a glass of hollands looking sadly upward so that the measure quite escaped him gentlemen of the jury he continued with such authority that the jury were almost ready to think that they must have begun to be gentlemen till they looked at one another 
gentlemen of the jury life is short and trouble long i have sat upon hundreds of poor people who destroyed themselves by nothing else than want of self-preservation i have made it my duty officially to discourage such shortcomings mr foreman be good enough to send the lemons this way and when ready for business say so crowner bowles was now as pleasant as he had been grumpy in the morning and finding him so we did our best to keep him in that humour neither was it long before he expressed himself in terms which were an honour alike to his heart and head for he told us in so many words though i was not of the jury now nevertheless i held on to them and having been foreman just now could not be for a matter of form when it came to glasses cold-shouldered worthy crowner bowles i say before he had stirred many slices of lemon told us all in so many words and the more the more we were pleased with them that for a thoroughly honest intelligent and hard-working jury commend him henceforth and as long as he held his majesty's sign manual to a jury made of newton parish and of kenfig burgesses we drank his health with bumpers round every man upon his legs and then three cheers for his lordship until his clerk who was rather sober put his thumb up and said stop and from the way he went on jerking with his narrow shoulders we saw that he would recall our thoughts to the hall that had no door to it then following his looks we saw the distance of the silence this took us all aback so much that we had in the witnesses with of whom i the head man was there already and for fear of their being nervous and so confusing testimony gave them a cordial after swearing everybody knew exactly what each one of them had to say but it would have been very hard and might have done them an injury not to let them say it the coroner having found no need to change except his rummer left his men for a little while to deliberate their verdict visitation of god of course it must be straddling williams began to say visitation of almighty god some of the jury took the pipes out of their mouths and nodded at him while they blew a ring of smoke and others nodded without that trouble and all seemed going pleasantly when suddenly a little fellow whose name was simon edwards a brother of the primitive christians or at least of their minister being made pugnacious by ardent spirits rose and holding the arm of his chair thus delivered the, his sentiments speaking of course in his native tongue head man and brothers of the jury i i i do altogether refuse and deny the goodness of that judgment the only judgment i will certify is in the lining of my hat judgment of almighty god for rabbiting on the sabbath day hezekiah perkins i call upon thee as a brother christian and a consistent member to stand on the side of the lord with me his power of standing on any side was by this time however exhausted and falling into his chair he turned pale and shrunk to the very back of it for over against him stood evan thomas whom none of us had seen till then it was a sight that sobered us and made the blood fly from our cheeks and forced us to set down the glass the face of black evan was ashy grey and his heavy square shoulders slouching forward and his hands hung by his side only his deep eyes shone without moving and simon backed further and further away without any power to gaze elsewhere then evan thomas turned from him without any word or so much as a sigh and looked at us all and no man had power to meet the cold quietness of his regard and not having thought much about his troubles we had nothing at all to say to him 
after waiting for us to begin and finding no one ready he spake a few words to us all in welsh and the tone of his voice seemed different noble gentlemen i am proud that my poor hospitality pleases you make the most of the time god gives for six of you have seen the white horse with these words he bowed his head and left us shuddering in the midst of all the heat of cordials for it is known that men when prostrate by a crushing act of god have the power to foresee the death of other men that feel no pity for them and to see the white horse on the night of a new moon even through closed eyelids and without sense of vision is the surest sign of all surest signs of death within the twelve month therefore all the jury sat glowering at one another each man ready to make oath that evan's eyes were not on him now there are things beyond our knowledge or right of explanation in which i have a pure true faith for instance the flying dutchman whom i had twice beheld already and whom no man may three times see and then survive the twelve month in him of course i had true faith for what can be clearer than eyesight many things too which brave seamen have beheld and can declare but as for landsmen's superstitions i scarcely cared to laugh at them however strange enough it is all black evan said came true simon edwards first went off by falling into newton wayne after keeping it up too late at chapel and after him the other five all within the twelve months some in their beds and some abroad but all gone to their last account and heartily glad i was for my part as one after other they dropped off thus not to have served on that second jury and heartily sorry i was also that brother hezekiah had not taken the luck to behold the white horse plain enough it will be now to any one who knows our parts that after what evan thomas said and the way in which he withdrew from us the only desire the jury had was to gratify him with their verdict and to hasten home ere the dark should fall and no man to walk by himself on the road accordingly without more tobacco though some took another glass for strength they returned the following verdict we find that these five young and excellent men here came their names with a mister to each were lost on their way to a place of worship by means of a violent storm of the sea and the jury cannot separate without offering their heartfelt pity the crowner's clerk changed it to sympathy to their bereaved and affectionate parents god save the king after this they all went home and it took good legs to keep up with them along priest lane in some of the darker places and especially where a white cow came and looked over a gate for the milking time i could not help laughing although myself not wholly free from uneasiness and i grieved that my joints were not as nimble as those of simon edwards but while we frightened one another like so many children each perceiving something which was worse to those who perceived it not hezekiah carried on as if we were a set of fools and nothing ever could frighten him to me who was the bravest of them this was very irksome but it happened that i knew brother perkins's pet belief his wife had lived at longlands once a lonely house between nottage and newton on the rise of a little hill and they say that on one night of the year all the funerals that must pass from nottage to newton in the twelvemonth go by in succession there with all the mourners after them and the very hymns that they will sing passing softly on the wind so as we were just by longlands in the early 
feet of the stars i managed to be at perkins's side then suddenly as a bat went by i caught the arm of a hezekiah and drew back and shivered name of god davy what's the matter can't you see them you blind eye there they go there they go all the coffins with palls to them and the names upon the head plates evan and thomas and hopkin and reese and jenkin with only four bearers and the psalm they sing is the thirty-fourth so it is i can see them all the lord have mercy upon my soul oh davy davy don't leave me here he could not walk another step but staggered against the wall and groaned and hid his face inside his hat we got him to newton with much ado but as for going to bridgend that night he found that our church clock must be seen to the very first thing in the morning End of chapter fifteen chapter sixteen of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter sixteen truth lies sometimes in a well the following morning it happened so that i did not get up over early not i assure you from any undue enjoyment of the grand crowner's quests but partly because the tide for fishing would not suit till the afternoon and partly because i had worked both hard and long at the jolly sailors and this in fulfilment of a pledge from which there was no escaping when i promised on the night before to grease and tune my violin and display the true practice of hornpipe rash enough this promise was on account of my dear wife's memory and the things bad people would say of it and but for the sad uneasiness created by black evan's privacy and the need of lively company to prevent my seeing white horses the fear of the parish might have prevailed with me over all fear of the landlord hence i began rather shyly but when my first tune had been received with hearty applause from all the room how could i allow myself to be clapped on the back and then be lazy now bunny was tugging and clamouring for her bit of breakfast almost before i was wide awake when the latch of my cottage door was lifted and in walked hezekiah almost any other man would have been more welcome for though he had not spoken of it on the day before he was sure to annoy me sooner or later about the fish he had forced me to sell him when such a matter is over and done with surely no man in common sense has a right to reopen the question the time to find fault with a fish in all conscience is before you have bought him having once done that he is now your own and to blame him is to find fault with the mercy which gave you the money to buy him a foolish thing as well because you are running down your own property and spoiling your relish for him conduct like this is below contempt even more ungraceful and ungracious than that of a man who spreads abroad the faults of his own wife hezekiah however on this occasion was not quite so bad as that his errand according to his lights was of a friendly nature for he pried all round my little room with an extremely sagacious leer and then gazed at me with a dark cock of his eye and glanced askance at bunny and managed to wink like the commodore's ship beginning to light poop lanterns speak out like a man i said is your wife confined with a prophecy or what is the matter with you hepzibah the prophetess is well and her prophecies are abiding the fullness of their fulfilment i would speak with you on a very secret and important matter concerning also her revealings then i will send the child away here bunny run and ask mother jones that will not do 
I will not speak here. Walls are thin, and walls have ears. Come down to the well with me. But the well is a lump of walls, I answered, and children almost always near it. There are no children. I have been down. The well is dry, and the children know it. No better place can be for speaking. Looking down across the churchyard, I perceived that he was right, and so I left Bunny to dwell on her breakfast and went with Hezekiah. Among the sand hills there was no one, for fright had fallen on everybody since the sands began to walk, as the general folk now declared of them and nobody looked at a sand-hill now with any other feeling than towards his grave and tombstone even my heart was a little heavy in spite of all scientific points when i straddled over the stone that led into the sandy passage after me came hezekiah groping with his grimy hands and calling out for me to stop until he could have hold of me however i left him to follow the darkness in the wake of his own ideas a better place for secret talk in a parish full of echoes scarcely could be found perhaps except the old red house on the shore so i waited for perkins to unfold as soon as we stood on the bottom step with three or four yards of quicksand but no dip for a pitcher below us the children knew that the well was dry and some of them perhaps were gone to try to learn their letters what then was my disappointment as it gradually came out that so far from telling me a secret hezekiah's object was to deprive me of my own however if i say what happened nobody can grumble in the first place he manoeuvred much to get the weather gauge of me by setting me so that the light that slanted down the grey slope should gather itself upon my honest countenance i for my part as a man unwarned how far it might become a duty to avoid excess of accuracy took the liberty to prefer a less conspicuous position not that i had any lies to tell but might be glad to hear some therefore i stuck to a pleasant seat upon a very nice sandy slab where the light so shot and wavered that a badly inquisitive man might seek in vain for a flush or a flickering of the most delicate light of all that which is cast by the heart or mind of man into the face of man upon the whole it could scarcely be said at least as concerned hezekiah that truth was to be found just now at the bottom of this well dear brother dio he gently began with the most brotherly voice and manner it has pleased the lord who does all things aright to send me to you for counsel now as well as for comfort beloved dio all that i have is at your service i answered very heartily looking for something about his wife and always enjoying a thing of that kind among those righteous fellows and we heard that hepzibah had taken up under word of the lord with the shakers brother david i have wrestled hard in the night season about that which has come to pass my wife to be sure i said my wife who was certified seven times as a vessel for the spirit to be sure they always are and then they gad about so brother you understand me not or desire to think evil hepzibah since her last confinement is a vessel for the spirit to the square of what she was seven times seven is forty-nine and requires no certificate but these are carnal calculations all this took me beyond my depth and i answered him rather crustily and my word ended with both those letters which as i learned from my catechism belong to us by baptism unholy david shun evil words pray without ceasing but swear not at all in a vision of the night hepzibah hath seen terrible things of thee why you never went home last night hezekiah how can you tell what your wife dreamed 
I said not when it came to pass, and how could I speak of it yesterday before that loose assembly? Well, well, out with it. What was this wonderful vision? Hepzibah, the prophetess, being in a trance and deeply inspired of the Lord, beheld the following vision. A long, lonely sea was spread before her, shining in the moonlight smoothly and in places strewed with gold a man was standing on a low black rock casting a line and drawing great fish out almost every time he cast then there arose from out the water a dear little child all dressed in white carrying with both hands her cradle and just like our little maiden martha like your dirty martha indeed i was at the very point of saying but snapped my lips and saved myself this small damsel approached the fisherman and presented her cradle to him with a very trustful smile then he said is it gold and she said no it is only a white lily upon which he shouted be off with you and the child fell into a desolate hole and groped about vainly for her cradle then all the light faded out of the sea and the waves and the rocks began moaning and the fisherman fell on his knees and sought in vain for the cradle and while he was moaning came satan himself bearing the cradle red hot and crackling and he seized the poor man by his blue woollen smock and laid him in the cradle and rocked it till his shrieks awoke hepzibah and hepzibah is certain that you are the man to hear all this in that sudden manner quite took my breath away for a minute so that i fell back and knocked my head purely innocent as i was but presently i began to hope that the prophetess might be wrong this time and the more so because that vile trance of hers might have come from excessive enjoyment of those good fish of mine and it grew upon me more and more the more i disliked her prediction about me that if she had such inspiration scarcely would she have sent hezekiah to buy her supper from my four-legged table therefore i spoke without much loss of courage brother hezekiah there is something wrong with hepzibah send her i pray you to dr ap yollop before she prophesies anything more no blue woollen smock have i worn this summer but a canvas jacket only and more often a striped jersey it is sandy macraw she has seen in her dream with the devil both roasting and rocking him glory be to the lord for it glory be to him dio whichever of you two it was i hope that it may have been sandy but hepzibah is always accurate even among fishermen even fishermen i answered being a little touched with wrath know the folk that understood them and the folk that cannot even fishermen have their right especially when reduced to it not to be blasphemed in that way even by a prophetess dio you are hot again what makes you go on so a friend's advice is such a thing that i nearly always take it unless i find big obstacles dio now be advised by me that depends on how i like it was the best thing i could say david llewellyn the only chance to save thy sinful soul is this open thine heart to the chosen one to the favoured of the lord confess to hepzibah the things that befell thee and how the tempter prevailed with thee especially bring forth my brother the accursed thing thou hast hid in thy tent the wedge of gold and the shekels of silver and the babylonish garment thou hast stolen and dissembled also and put it even among thine own stuff cast it from thee deliver it up lay it before the ark of the lord and hepzibah shall fall down and pray lest thou be consumed and burnt with fire like the son of carmi the son of zabdi and covered over with a great heap of stones even such as this is 
my wrath at this foul accusation and daring attempt to frighten me was kindled so that i could not speak and if this had happened in the open air i should have been certain to knock him down however i began to think for perkins was a litigious fellow and however strict a man's conduct is he does not want his affairs all exposed therefore i kept my knit knuckles at home but justly felt strong indignation perkins thought he had terrified me for perhaps in that bad light i looked pale and so he began to triumph upon me which needs as everybody knows a better man than hezekiah come come brother dio he said in a voice quite different from the chapel scriptural style he had used you see we know all about it two dear children come ashore one dead and the other not dead you contrived to receive them both with your accustomed poaching skill for everybody says that you are always to be found everywhere except in your chapel on sabbath day now david what do our good people having families of their own find upon these children not so much as a chain or locket or even a gold pin i am a jeweller and i know that children of high position always have some trinket on them when their mothers love them a child with a coronet and no gold david this is wrong of wrong and worse than this you conceal the truth even from me your ancient friend there must be a great deal to be made either from those who would hold them in trust or from those in whose way they stood for the family died out very likely in all male inheritance think what we might make of it by acting under my direction and you shall have half of it all old davy by relieving your mind and behaving in a sensible and religious manner this came home to my sense of experience more than all hepzibah's divine predictions or productions at the same time i saw that hezekiah was all abroad in the dark and groping right and left after the bodily truth and what call had he to cry shares with me because he had more reputation and a higher conceit of himself of course but it crossed my mind that this nasty fellow being perhaps in front of me in some little tricks of machinery might be useful afterwards in getting at the real truth which often kept me awake at night only i was quite resolved not to encourage roguery by letting him into partnership perceiving my depth of consideration for it suited my purpose to hear him out and learn how much he suspected it was natural that he should try again to impress me yet further by boasting dio i have been at a latin school for as much as three months together my father gave me a rare education and i made the most of it none of your ignorance for me i am up to the moods and the tenses the accidents and the proselytes the present i know and the future i know the peter perfection and the hay roost i call that stuff gibberish talk plain english if you can understand you then so much as this i speak in a carnal manner now i speak as a fool unto a fool i am up to snuff good dio i can tell the time of day then you are a devilish deal cleverer than any of your clocks are but now thou speakest no parables brother now i know what thou meanest thou art up for robbing somebody and if i would shun satan's clutches i must come and help thee dio this is inconsistent nor can i call it brotherly we wish to do good both you and i and to raise a little money for works of love you no doubt with a good end in view to console you for much tribulation and i with a single eye to the advancement of the cause which i have at heart to save many brands from the burning then dio why not act together why not help one another dear brother thou with the good luck and i with the brains he laid his hand on my shoulder kindly with a yearning of his bowels towards me such as true nonconformists feel at the scent of any money i found myself also a little moved not being certain how far it was wise to throw him altogether over but suddenly by what means i know not except the will of providence there arose before me that foul wrong which the nicodemus christian had committed against me some three years back 
i had forborne to speak of it till now wishing to give the man fair play hezekiah do you remember i asked with such solemnity do you remember your twentieth wedding day davy my brother how many times never mind talking about that now you had a large company coming and to whom did you give a special order to catch you a turbo at ten pence a pound nay nay my dear friend dio shall i never get that thing out of your stupid head you had known me for twenty years at least as the very best fisherman on the coast and a man that could be relied upon yet you must go and give that order not to a man of good welsh blood with ten welshmen coming to dinner mine not to a man that was bred and born within five miles of your dirty house not to a man that knew every cranny and crinkle of sand where the turbo lie but to a tag rag scotchman it was spoken of upon every pebble from britain ferry to aberthaw david llewellyn put under the feet of a fellow like sandy macraw a beggarly interloping freckled bitter weed of a scotchman well davy i have apologized how many times more must i do it it was not that i doubted your skill you tell us of that so often that none of us ever questioned it it was simply because i feared just then to come near your excellent and lamented no excuses no excuses mr perkins if you please you only make the matter worse as if a man's wife could come into the question when it comes to business yours may because you don't know how to manage her but mine well now she is gone dio and very good she was to you and in your heart you know it whether he said this roguishly or from the feeling which all of us have when it comes to one another i declare i knew not then and i know not even now for i did not feel so sharply up to look to mine own interest with these recollections over me i waited for him to begin again but he seemed to stick back in the corner and in spite of all that turbo business at the moment i could not help holding out my hand to him he took it and shook it with as much emotion as if he had truly been fond of my wife and i felt that nothing more must be said concerning that order to sandy macraw it seemed to be very good reason also for getting out of that interview for i might say things to be sorry for if i allowed myself to go on any more with my heart so open therefore i called in my usual briskness lo the water is rising the children must be at the mouth of the well what will the good wife prophesy if she sees thee coming up the stairs with thy two feet soaking wet master hezekiah End of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of sky by r d blackmore chapter seventeen for a little change of air on the very next day i received such a visit as never had come to my house before for while i was trimming my hooks and wondering how to get out of all this trouble with my conscience sound and my pocket improved suddenly i heard a voice not to be found anywhere i answered to yachtel i yachtkin put me down there curly i ants to see old davy and old davy wants to see you you beauty i cried as she jumped like a little wild kid and took all my house with a glance and then me doesn't know i yikes this house and i yikes a uh, and i yikes yatkin and nickel bunny and everybody she pointed all round for everybody with all ten fingers spread every way then watkin came after her like her slave with a foolish grin on his countenance in spite of the undertaking business if you please sir mr llewellyn he said we was forced to bring her over she have been crying so dreadful and shivering about the black pit hole so and when the black things came into the house she was going clean out of her little mind ever so many times almost no use it was at all to tell her ever so much a yard they was i don't yike back and i on't have back yite i uh, yikes and boo i yikes and my dear papa be so very angry when i tells him all about it 
she went on like that and she did so cry mother said she must change the air a bit all the time he was telling me this she watched him with her head on one side and her lips kept ready in the most comic manner as much as to say now you tell any stories at my expense and you may look out but watkin was truth itself and she nodded and said ness at the end of his speech and if you please sir mr llewellyn whatever is a belung sir all the way she have been asking for belung 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 and i cannot tell for the life of me whatever is belung boy never ask what is unbecoming i replied in a manner which made him blush according to my intention for the word might be english for all i knew and have something of high life in it however i found by and by that it meant what she was able to call amabella when promoted a year in the dictionary but now anybody should only have seen her who wanted a little rousing up my cottage of course is not much to boast of compared with castles and so on nevertheless there is something about it pleasant and good like its owner you might see ever so many houses and think them larger and grander and so on with more opportunity for sitting down and less for knocking your head perhaps and after all you would come back to mine not for the sake of the meat in the cupboard because i seldom had any and far inferior men had more but because well it does not matter i never could make you understand unless you came to see it only i felt that i had found a wonderful creature to make me out and enter almost into my own views of which the world is not capable every time i took this child up and down the staircase she would have jumps and she made me talk in a manner that quite surprised myself and such a fine feeling grew up between us that it was a happy thing for the whole of us not to have bunny in the way just then mother jones was giving her apple party as she always did when the red streaks came upon her early margarets but i always think the white june eating is a far superior apple and i have a tree of it my little garden is nothing grand any more than the rest of my premises or even myself if it comes to that still you might go for a long day's walk and find very few indeed to beat it unless you were contradictory for ten doors at least both west and east this was admitted silently as was proved by their sending to me for a cabbage an artichoke or an onion or anything choice for a sunday dinner it may suit these very people now to shake their heads and to run me down but they should not forget what i did for them when it comes to pronouncing fair judgment poor bardie appeared as full of bright spirit and as brave as ever and when she tumbled from jumping two steps what did she do but climb back and jump three which even bunny was afraid to do but i soon perceived that this was only a sort of a flash in the pan as it were the happy change from the gloom of scar house from the silent corners and creaking stairs and long-faced people keeping watch and howling every now and then also the sight of me again whom she looked upon as her chief protector and the general air of tidiness belonging to my dwelling these things called forth all at once the play and joyful spring of her nature but when she began to get tired of this and to long for a little coaxing even the stupidest gaffer could see that she was not the child she had been her little face seemed pinched and pale and prematurely grave and odd while in the grey eyes tears shone ready at any echo of thought to fall also her forehead broad and white which marked her so from common children looked as if too much of puzzling and of wondering had been done there even the gloss of her rich brown pall was faded with none to care for it while the dainty feet and hands so sensitive as to a speck of dirt were enough to bring the tears of pity into a careful mother's eyes guardy la ooky see hot disgustin nailey palies and poor bardie nuffin to keen em with 
while i was setting this grief to rest for which she kissed me beautifully many thoughts came through my mind about this little creature she and i were of one accord upon so many important points and when she differed from me perhaps she was in the right almost which is a thing that i never knew happen in a whole village of grown-up people and by the time i had brushed her hair and tied up the bows of her frock afresh and when she began to dance again and to play every kind of trick with me i said to myself i must have this child whatever may come of it i will risk when the price of butcher's meat comes down this i said in real earnest but the price of butcher's meat went up and i never have known it come down again while i was thinking our bunny came in full of apples raw and roasted and of things the children said but at the very first sight of bardie everything else was gone from her all the other children were fit only to make dirt pies of this confirmed and held me steadfast in the opinions which i had formed without any female assistance in spite of all her own concerns of which she was full enough goodness knows bunny came up and pulled at her by reason of something down her back which wanted putting to rights a little a plait or a tuck or some manner of gear only i thought it a clever thing and the little one approved of it and then our bunny being in her best these children took notice of one another to settle which of them was nearer to the proper style of clothes and each admired the other for anything which she had not got herself come you baby chits said i being pleased at their womanly ways so early all of us want some food i think can we eat our dresses the children of course understood me not nevertheless what i said was sense and if to satisfy womankind for which i have deepest regard and respect i am forced to enter into questions higher than reason of men can climb of washing and ironing and quilling and goffering and setting up and styles of transparent reefing and all our other endeavours to fetch this child up to her station the best thing i can do will be to have mother jones in to write it for me if only she can be forced to spell however that is beyond all hope and even i find it hard sometimes to be sure of the royal manner only i go by the bible always for every word that i can find being taught ever since i could read it all that his majesty james i confirmed it now this is not all the thing which i wanted to put before you clearly because i grow like a tombstone often only fit to make you laugh when i stand on my right to be serious my great desire is to tell you what i did and how i did it as to the managing of these children even for a day or two so as to keep them from crying or scorching or spoiling their clothes or getting wet or having too much victuals or too little of course i consulted that good mother jones five or six times every day and she never was weary of giving advice though she said every time that it must be the last and a lucky thing it was for me in all this responsibility to have turned enough of money through skilful catch and sale of fish to allow of my staying at home a little and not only washing and mending of clothes but treating the whole of the household to the delicacies of the season however it is not my habit to think myself anything wonderful that i leave to the rest of the world and no doubt any good and clever man might have done a great part of what i did only if anything should befall us out of the reach of a sailor's skill and the depth of bunny's experience mother jones promised to come straight in the very moment i knocked at the wall and her husband slept with such musical sound that none could be lonely in any house near and so did all of her ten children who could crack a lollipop upon the whole we passed so smoothly over the first evening with the two children as hard at play as if they were paid fifty pounds for it that having some twenty-five shillings in hand after payment of all creditors and only ten weeks to my pension day with my boat unknown to anybody and a very good prospect of fish running up from the mumbles at the next full moon i set the little one on my lap 
after a good bout of laughing at her very queer ins and outs for all things seemed to be all alive with as well as to her will you stay with me my dear i said as bold as king george and the dragon would you like to live with old davy and bunny and have ever so many frocks washed soon as ever he can buy them for nothing satisfied her better than to see her own gown washed she laid her head on one side a little so that i felt it hot to my bosom being excused of my waistcoat and i knew that she had overworked herself ness she said after thinking a bit ness i live with a old davy till my dear mamma come for me does ye know old davy hot i thinks no my pretty i only know that you are always thinking and so she was no doubt of it i tell a old davy hot i thinks no i can tell a only something et me go for more pay with bunny no my dear just stop a minute bunny has got no breath left in her she is such a great fat bunny what you mean to say is that you don't know how papa and mamma could ever think of leaving you such a long long time away she shook her curly pate as if each frizzle were a puzzle and her sweet white forehead seemed a mainsail full of memory and then gay presence was in her eyes and all the play which i had stopped broke upon her mind again tinker tailor soldier sailor she began with her beautiful fingers crawling like white carnelian compasses up the well-made buttons of my new smock guernsey for though i had begged my hot waistcoat off i never was lax of dress in her presence as i would be in bunnies or in short with anybody except this little lady i myself taught her that tinker tailor and had a right to have it done to me and she finished it off with such emphasis upon button number seven which happened to be the last of them gentleman ploughboy fief looking straight into my eyes and both of us laughing at the fine idea that i could possibly be called a thief but fearing to grow perhaps foolish about her as she did these charming things to me i carried her up to bed with bunny and sung them both away to sleep with a melancholy dirge of sea into whatever state of life it may please god to call me though i fear there cannot be many more at this age of writing it always will be as it always has been my first principle and practice to do my very utmost which is far less than it was since the doctor stopped my hornpipes to be pleasant and good company and it is this leading motive which has kept me from describing as i might have done to make you tingle and be angry afterwards the state of scar house and of evan thomas and moxy his wife and all their friends about those five poor rabbiters also other darkish matters such as the plight of those obstinate black men when they came ashore at last three together and sometimes four as if they had fought in the water and after all what luck they had in obtaining proper obsequies inasmuch as by order of crowner bowles a great hole in the sand was dug in a little sheltered valley and kept open till it was fairly thought that the sea must have finished with them and then after being carefully searched for anything of value they were rolled in all together and kept down with stones like the parish mangle and covered with a handsome mound of sand and not only this but in spite of expense and the murmuring of the vestry a board well tarred to show their colour was set up in the midst of it and their number thirty-five chalked up and so they were stopped of their mischief a while after shamefully robbing their poor importer but if this was conducted handsomely how much more so were the funerals of the five young white men the sense of the neighbourhood and the stir and the presence of the coroner who stopped a whole week for sea air and freshness after seeing so many good things come in and perceiving so many ways home that night that he made up his mind to none of them also the feeling 
which no one expressed but all would have been disappointed of that honest black evan after knocking so many men down in both parishes and the extra parochial manner was designed by this downright blow from above to repent and to entertain every one and most of all the fact that five of a highly respectable family were to be buried at once to the saving of four future funerals all of which must have been fine ones these universal sympathies compelled the house and the people therein to exert themselves to the uttermost enough that it gave satisfaction not universal but general and even that last is a hard thing to do in such great outbursts of sympathy though moodland church is more handy for scar and the noble portreeve of kenfig stood upon his right to it still there were stronger reasons why old newton should have the preference and scar being outside either parish crowner bowles on receipt of a guinea swore down the portreeve to his very vamps for moxy thomas was a newton woman and loved every scrape of a shoe there and her uncle the clerk would have ended his days if the fees had gone over to kenfig our parson as well was a very fine man and a match for the whole of the service while the little fellow at moodland always coughed at a word of three syllables there was one woman in our village who was always right she had been disappointed three times over in her early and middle days and the effect of this on her character was so lasting and so wholesome that she never spoke without knowing something when from this capital female i heard that our churchyard had won the victory and when i foresaw the demented condition of glory impending upon our village not only from five magnificent palls each with its proper attendance of black and each with fine hymns and good howling but yet more than that from the hot strength of triumph achieved over vaunting kenfig then it came into my mind to steal away with bardie a stern and sad sacrifice of myself i assured myself that it was and would be for few even of our oldest men could enjoy a funeral more than i did with its sad reflections and junketings and i might have been head man of all that day entitled not only to drop the mould but to make the speech afterwards at the inn but i abandoned all these rights and braved once more the opinions of neighbours which any man may do once too often and when the advance of sound came towards us borne upon the western wind from the end of newton wane slowly hanging through the air as if the air loved death of man the solemn singing of the people who must go that way themselves and told it in their melody and when the clevis rock rung softly with the tolling bell as well as with the rolling dirges we slipped away at the back of it that is to say pretty bardie and i for bunny was purer of newton birth than to leave such a sight without tearing away and desiring some little to hear all about it i left her with three very good young women smelling strongly of southern wood who were beginning to weep already and promised to tell me the whole of it as we left this dismal business bardie danced along beside me like an ostrich feather blown at in among the sand hills soon i got her where she could see nothing and the thatch of rushes deadened every pulse of the funeral bell and then a strange idea took me all things being strange just now that it might prove a rich wise thing to go for a quiet cruise with bardie in that boat and on the waves she might remember things recovered by the chance of semblance therefore knowing that all living creatures five miles either way of us were sure to be in newton churchyard nearly all the afternoon and then in the public-houses i scrupled not to launch my boat and go to sea with the little one for if we steered a proper course no funeral could see us and so i shipped her gingerly the glory of her mind was such that overboard she must have jumped except for my sunday necktie with a half-hitch knot around her and the more i rode the more she laughed and looked at the sun with her eyes screwed up and at the water with all wide open 
Hair is a goin old davy she said slipping from under my sunday splice and coming to me wonderfully and laying her tiny hands on mine which beat me always as she had found out is a goin to my dear papa and mamma and ickle brother no my pretty you must wait for them to come we are going to catch some fish and salt them that they may keep with a very fine smell till your dear papa brings your mamma and all the family with him and then what a supper we will have illa she said and poor bardie too but the distance of the supper-time was a very sad disappointment to her and her bright eyes filled with haze and then she said ness very quietly because she was growing to understand that she could not have her own way now i lay on my oars and watched her carefully while she was shaking her head and wondering with her little white shoulders above the thwart and her innocent and intelligent eyes full of the spreading sky and sea it was not often one had the chance through the ever flitting change to learn the calm and true expression of that poor young creature's face even now i could not tell except that her playful eyes were lonely and her tender lips were trembling and a heart full of simple love could find no outlet and lost itself these little things when thinking thus or having thought flow through them never ought to be disturbed because their brains are tender the unknown stream will soon run out and then they are fit again for play which is the proper work of man we open the world and we close the world with nothing more than this and while our manhood is too grand for a score and a half of years perhaps to take things but in earnest the justice of our birth is on us we are fortune's plaything End of chapter 17chapter 18 of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter eighteen public approbation if that child had no luck herself except of course in meeting me at any rate she never failed to bring me wondrous fortune the air was smooth and sweet and soft the sky had not a wrinkle and the fickle sea was smiling proud of pleasant manners directly i began to fish at the western tail of the tuscar scarcely a fish forbore me whiting pollocks run in shoals and a shoal i had of them and the way i split and dried them made us long for breakfast time and bardie did enjoy them so the more i dwelled with that little child the more i grew wrapped up in her her nature was so odd and loving and her ways so pretty many men forego their goodness so that they forget the nature of a little darling child otherwise perhaps we might not if we kept our hearts aright so despise the days of loving and the time of holiness now this baby almost shamed me and i might say bunny too when having undressed her and put the coarse rough nightgown on her which came from scar with the funerals my grandchild called me from upstairs to meet some great emergency granny come up with the stick directly moment granny dear missy aunt go unto bed such a bad wicked child she is i ran upstairs and there was bunny all on fire with noble wrath and there stood bardie sadly scraping the worm-eaten fork with her small white toes i's not a yicked child she said i's a yea good girl i is i ain't goin to bed till i say my prayers to mighty god as my dear mamma make me she be very angry with a uh, bunny hen she knows it hereupon i gave bunny a nice little smack and had a great mind to let her taste the stick which she had invoked so eagerly however she roared enough without it because her feelings were deeply hurt bardie also cried for company 
or perhaps at my serious aspect until i put her down on her knees and bade her say her prayers and have done with it at the same time it struck me how stupid i was not to have asked about this before inasmuch as even a child's religion may reveal some of its history she knelt as prettily as could be with her head thrown back and her tiny palms laid together upon her breast and thus she said her simple prayer pay god bless dear papa and mamma and ickle bother gentle jesus meek and ma ook upon a ickle child and make me a good gal amen then she got up and kissed poor bunny and was put into bed as good as gold and slept like a little dormouse till morning take it all together now we had a happy time of it every woman in newton praised me for my kindness to the child and even the men who had too many could not stand against bardie's smile they made up indeed some scandalous story as might have been expected about my relationship to the baby and her sudden appearance so shortly after my poor wife's death however by knocking three men down i produced a more active growth of charity in our neighbourhood and very soon a thing came to pass such as i never could have expected and of a nature to lift me even more than the free use of my pole for a period of at least six months above the reach of libel from any one below the rank of a justice of the peace this happened just as follows one night the children were snug in bed and finding the evenings long because the days were shortening in so fast which seemed to astonish everybody it came into my head to go no more than outside my own door and into the jolly sailors for the autumn seemed to be coming on and i like to express my opinions upon that point in society never being sure where i may be before ever another autumn moreover the landlord was not a man to be neglected with impunity he never liked his customers to stay too long away from him any more than our parson did and pleasant as he was when pleased and generous in the way of credit to people with any furniture nothing was more sure to vex him than for a man without excuse to pretend to get on without him now when i came into the room where our little sober proceedings are a narrow room and dark enough yet full of much good feeling also with hard wooden chairs worn soft by generations of sitting a sudden stir arose among the excellent people present they turned and looked at me as if they had never enjoyed that privilege or at any rate had failed to make proper use of it before and ere my modesty was certain whether this were for good or harm they raised such a clapping with hands and feet and a clinking of glasses in a line with it that i felt myself worthy of some great renown i stood there and bowed and made my best leg and took off my hat in acknowledgment observing this they were all delighted as if i had done them a real honour and up they arose with one accord and gave me three cheers with an englishman setting the proper tune for it i found myself so overcome all at once with my own fame and celebrity that i call for a glass of hot rum and water with the nipple of a lemon in it and sugar the size of a nutmeg my order was taken with a speed and deference hitherto quite unknown to me and better than that seven men opened purses and challenged the right to pay for it entering into so rare a chance of getting on quite gratis and knowing that such views are quick to depart i call for six ounces of tobacco with the bristol stamp a red crown upon it scarce had i tested the draught of a pipe which i had to do sometimes for half an hour with all to blow out and no drawing in when the tobacco was at my elbow served with a saucer and a curtsey well thought i this is real glory and i longed to know how i had earned it 
it was not likely with all those people gazing so respectfully that i would deign to ask them coarsely what the deuce could have made them do it i had always felt myself unworthy of obscure position and had dreamed for many years of having my merits perceived at last and to ask the reason would have been indeed a degradation although there was not a fibre of me but quivered to know all about it herein however i overshot the mark as i found out afterwards for my careless manner made people say that i must have written the whole myself a thing so very far below me that i scorned to answer it but here it is and then you can judge from the coarse style and the three-decked words whether it be work of mine felix farley's bristol journal saturday july twenty fourth seventeen eighty two shipwreck and loss of all hands heroism of a british tar we hear of a sad catastrophe from the coasts of glamorganshire the season of great heat and drought from which our readers must have suffered broke up as they may kindly remember with an almost unprecedented gale of wind and thunder on sunday the eleventh day of this month in the height of the tempest a large ship was descried cast by the fury of the elements upon a notorious reef of rocks at a little place called scar about twenty miles to the east of swansea serious apprehensions were entertained by the spectators for the safety of the crew which appeared to consist of black men their fears were too truly verified for in less than an hour the ill-fated bark succumbed to her cruel adversaries no adult male of either colour appears to have reached the shore alive although a celebrated fisherman and heroic pensioner of our royal navy whose name is david llewellyn and who traces his lineage from the royal bard of that patronymic performed prodigies of valour and proved himself utterly regardless of his own respectable and blameless life by plunging repeatedly into the boiling surges and battling with the raging elements in the vain hope of extricating the sufferers from a watery grave with the modesty which appears to be under some inscrutable law of nature inseparable from courage of the highest order this heroic tar desires to remain in obscurity this we could not reconcile with our sense of duty and if any lover of our black brethren finds himself moved by this narration we shall be happy to take charge of any remittance marked d l it grieves us to add that none escaped except an intelligent young female who clung to the neck of llewellyn she states that the ship was the andalusia and had sailed from appledore which is we believe in devonshire the respected coroner bowles held an inquest which afforded universal satisfaction deeply surprised as i was to find how accurately upon the whole this paper had got the story of it for not much less than half was true it was at first a puzzle to me how they could have learned so much about myself and the valiant manner in which i intended to behave but found no opportunity until i remembered that a man possessing a very bad hat had requested the honour of introducing himself to me in my own house and had begged me by all means to consider myself at home and to allow him to send for refreshment which i would not hear of twice but gave him what i thought up to his mark according to manners and appearance and very likely he made a mistake between my description of what i was ready as well as desirous to carry out and what i bodily did go through i and more to the back of it however i liked this account very much and resolved to encourage yet more warmly the next man who came to me with a bad hat what then was my disgust at perceiving at the very foot of that fine description a tissue of stuff like the following another account from a highly esteemed correspondent the great invasion of sand which has for so many generations spread such wide devastation and occasioned such grievous loss to landowners on the western coast of glamorganshire made another great stride in the storm of sabbath day july eleventh 
a vessel of considerable burthen named the andalusia and laden with negroes most carefully shipped for conversion among the good merchants of bristol appears to have been swallowed up by the sand and our black fellow-creatures disappeared it is to be feared from this visitation of an ever benign providence that few of them had been converted and that the burden of their sins disabled them from swimming if one had been snatched as a brand from the burning gladly would we have recorded it and sent him forward prayerfully for sustenance on his way to the lord but the only eye-witness whose word must never be relied upon when mammon enters into the conflict a worn-out but well-meaning sailor who fattens upon the revenue of an overburdened country this man ran away so fast that he saw hardly anything the lord however knoweth his own in the days of visitation a little child came ashore alive and a dead child bearing a coronet many people have supposed that the pusillanimous sailor aforesaid knows much more than he will tell it is not for us to enter into that part of the question duty however compels us to say that any one desiring to have a proper comprehension of this heavy but righteous judgment for he doeth all things well cannot do better than apply to the well-known horologist of bridgend hezekiah perkins also to the royal family the above yarn may simply be described as a gallows rope spun by jack ketch himself from all the lies of all the scoundrels he has ever hanged added to all that his own vile heart can invent with the devil to help him the cold-blooded creeping and crawling manner in which i myself was alluded to although without the manliness even to set my name down as well as the low hypocrisy of the loathsome white-livered syntax of it made me well i will say no more the filthiness reeks without my stirring and indeed no honest man should touch it only if hezekiah perkins had chanced to sneak into the room just then his wife might have prophesied shrouds and weeds for who else was capable of such lies slimed with so much sanctimony like cellar slugs or bilge hole rats rolling in angelica while all their entrails are of brimstone such as satan would scorn to vomit a bitter pain went up my right arm for the weakness of my heart when that miscreant gave me insult and i never knocked him down the well and over and over again i have found it a thorough mistake to be always forgiving however to have done with reflections which must suggest themselves to any one situated like me if indeed any one ever was after containing myself on account of the people who surrounded me better than could have been hoped for i spoke because they expected it truly my dear friends i am thankful for your good will towards me also to the unknown writer who has certainly made too much of my poor unaided efforts i did my best it was but little and who dreams of being praised for it again i am thankful to this other writer who has overlooked me altogether for the sake of poor sandy macraw we must thank him that he kindly forbore to make public the name you should have seen the faces of all the folk around the table when i gave them this surprise why said one we thought for sure that it was you he was meaning do you dear and in our hearts we were angry to him for such falsehoods large and black indeed and indeed true enough it may be of a man outlandish such as sandy macraw is let us not hasten to judge i replied sandy is brave enough i dare say and he can take his own part well i will not believe that he ran away very likely he never was there at all if he was he deserves high praise for taking some little care of himself i should not have been so stiff this night if i had only had the common sense to follow his example all our people began to rejoice and yet they required as all of us do something more than strongest proof what reason is to show then do you that this man of letters meant not you but sandy macraw to run away so hopkin read it aloud 
i said neither do i know nor care what the writer's meaning was only i thought there was something spoken about his majesty's revenue is it i or is it sandy that belongs to the revenue this entirely settled it all our people took it up and neglected not to tell one another so that in less than three days time my name was spread far and wide for the praise and the scotsman's for the condemnation i desired it not as my friends well knew but what used to beat to windward against the breath of the whole of the world therefore i was not so obstinate as to set my opinion against the rest but left it to macraw to rebut if he could his pusillanimity as for hezekiah perkins all his low creations fell upon the head from which they sprang i spoke to our rector about his endeavour to harm a respectable newton man for you might call macraw that by comparison though he lived in porthcall and was not respectable and everybody was struck with my kindness in using such handsome terms of arrival the result was that perkins lost our church clock which paid him as well as a many to others having been presented to the parish and therefore not likely to go without pushing for our rector was a peppery man except when in the pulpit and what he said to hezekiah was exactly this what perkins another great bill again to repair of church clock seven and sixpence to ten miles travelling at three pence per mile and so on and so on why you never came further than my brother the colonel's the last three times you have charged for allow me to ask you a little question to whom did you go for the keys of the church as if i should want any keys of the church there is no church lock in the county that i cannot open as soon as whistle indeed so you pick our lock do you ever open a church door honestly for the purpose of worshipping the lord i have kept my eye upon you sir because i hear that you have been reviling my parishioners and i happen to know that you never either opened the lock of our church or picked it for the last three times you have charged for but one thing you have picked for many years and that is the pocket of my ratepayers be off sir be off with your trumpery bill we will have a good churchman to do our clock a thoroughly honest seaman and a regular church-goer do you mean that big thief davy llewellyn well well do as you please but i will thank you to pay my bill first thank me when you get it sir you may fall down on your canting knees and thank the lord for one thing what am i to thank the lord for for allowing you to cheat me thus for giving me self-command enough not to knock you down sir with that the rector came so nigh him that brother perkins withdrew in haste for the parson had done that sort of thing to people who ill-used him and the sense of the parish was always with him hence the management of the church clock passed entirely into my hands and i kept it almost always going at less than half hezekiah's price and this reunited me to the church from which my poor wife perhaps had led me astray some little by a monthly arrangement which reflected equal credit on either party and even this was not the whole of the blessings that now rolled down upon me for the sake no doubt of little bardy as with the ark in the bible for this fine felix farley was the only great author of news at that time prevalent among us it is true that there was another journal nearer to us at harford and a highly good one but for a very clear reason it failed to have command of the public houses for the customers liked both their pipes and their papers to be of the same origin and go together kindly and hereford sent out no tobacco while bristol was more famous for the best virginian bird's eye than even for rum or intelligence therefore as everybody gifted with the gift of reading came to the public-houses gradually and to compare interpretation over those two narratives both of which stirred our county up my humble name was in their mouths as freely and approvingly as the sealing wax end of their pipe stems unanimous consent accrued when all had said the same thing over fifty times in different manners and with fine-drawn argument that after all and upon the whole david llewellyn was an honour to county and to country 
after that for at least a fortnight no more dogs were set on me when i showed myself over a gentleman's gate in the hope of selling fish to him it used to be always at him pincher into his legs growler boy so that i was compelled to carry my congerod to save me now however and for a season till my fame grew stale i never lifted the latch of a gate without hearing grateful utterance towser down you son of a gun yelp and vic hold your stupid tongues will you the value of my legs was largely understood by gentlemen as for the ladies and the housemaids if conceit were in my nature what a run it would have had always and always the same am i and above even women's opinions but i know no other man whose head would not have been turned with a day of it for my rap at the door was scarcely given louder perhaps than it used to be before every maid in the house was out and the lady looking through the blinds i used to dance on the step and beat my arms on my breast with my basket down between my legs and tremble almost for a second rap and then it was like your imperence none of your stinking stuff and so on but now they ran down beautifully and looked up under their eyelids at me and left me to show them what i liked and never beat down a halfpenny and even accepted my own weight such is the grand effect of glory and i might have kissed every one of them and many even of the good plain cooks if i could have reconciled it with my sense of greatness End of chapter eighteen chapter nineteen of the maid of scar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the maid of scar by r d blackmore chapter nineteen a craft beyond the law colonel lower of candleston court was one of the finest and noblest men it was ever my luck to come across he never would hear a word against me any more than i would against him and no sooner did i see him upon the bench than i ceased to care what the evidence was if they failed to prove their falsehoods as nearly always came to pass he dismissed them with a stern reprimand for taking away my character and if they seemed to establish anything by low devices against me what did he say why no more than this david if what they say be true you appear to have forgotten yourself in a very unusual manner you have promised me always to improve and i thought that you were doing it this seems to be a trifling charge however i must convict you the penalty is one shilling and the costs fifteen may it please your worship i always used to answer is an honest man to lose his good name and pay those who have none for stealing it having seen a good deal of the world he always felt the force of this but found it difficult to say so with prejudiced men observing him only i knew that my fine and costs would be slipped into my hand by and by with a glimpse of the candleston livery this was no more than fair between us for not more than seven generations had passed since griffith llewellyn of my true stock had been the proper and only bard to the great lord lower of coety whence descended our good colonel there had been some little mistake about the departure of the title no doubt through extremes of honesty but no lord in the county came of better blood than colonel lower to such a man it was a hopeless thing for the bitterest enemy if he had one to impute one white hair's breadth of departure from the truth a thoroughly noble man to look at and a noble man to hearken to because he knew not his own kindness but was kind to every one now this good man had no child at all as generally happens to very good men for fear of mankind improving much and the great king of israel david from whom our family has a tradition yet without any jewish blood in us 
he says if i am not mistaken that it is a sure mark of the ungodly to have children at their desire and to leave the rest of their substance to ungodly infants not to be all alone the colonel after the death of his excellent wife persuaded his only sister the lady bluett widow of lord bluett to set up with him at candleston and this she was not very loath to do because her eldest son the present lord bluett was of a wild and sporting turn and no sooner became of age but that he wanted no mother over him therefore she left him for a while to his own devices hoping every month to hear of his suddenly repenting now this was a lady fit to look at you might travel all day among people that kept drawing-rooms and greenhouses and the new safe of music well named from its colour grand peony and you might go up and down bridge end even on a fair day yet nobody would you set eyes on fit to be looked at as a lady on the day that you saw lady bluett it was not that she pretended anything that made all the difference only she felt such a thorough knowledge that she was no more than we might have been except for a width of accidents and nothing ever parted her from any one with good in him for instance the first time she saw me again after thirty years perhaps from the season of her beauty charm when i had chanced to win all the prizes in the sports given at candleston court for the manhood of now colonel lower not only did she at once recognize me in spite of all my battering but she held out her beautiful hand and said how are you mr llewellyn nobody had ever called me mr llewellyn much till then but by good luck a washerwoman heard it and repeated it and since that day there are not many people leaving out clods and low enemies with the face to accost me otherwise however this is not to the purpose any more than it is worthy of me how can it matter what people call me when i am clear of my fish-basket as indeed i always feel at the moment of unstrapping no longer any reputation to require my fist ready i have done my utmost and i have received the money these are the fine perceptions which preserve a man of my position from the effects of calumny and next to myself the principal guardian of my honour was this noble colonel lower moreover a fine little chap there was lady bluett's younger son honourable rodney bluett by name for his father had served under admiral rodney and been very friendly with him and brought him to church as a godfather this young rodney bluett was about ten years old at that time and the main delight of his life was this to come fishing with old davy the wondrous yarns i used to spin had such an effect on his little brain that his prospects on dry land and love of his mother and certain inheritance from the colonel were helpless to keep him from longing always to see the things which i had seen with his large blue eyes upon me and his flaxen hair tied back and his sleeves tucked up for paddling hour by hour he would listen when the weather was too rough to do much more than look at it or if we went out in a boat as we did when he could pay for hiring and when his mother was out of the way many and many a time i found him when he should have been quick with the bait dwelling upon the fine ideas which my tales had bred in him i took no trouble in telling them neither did i spare the truth when it would come in clumsily like a lubber who cannot touch his hat but they all smell good and true because they had that character however he must bide his time as every one of us has to do before i make too much of him and just at the period now in hand he was down in my black books for never coming near me it may have been that he had orders not to be so much with me and very likely that was wise for neither his mother nor his uncle could bear the idea of his going to sea but meant to make a red herring of him as we call those poor land soldiers being so used to his pretty company and his admiration also helping him as i did to spend his pocket-money i missed him more than i could have believed neither could i help sorrowing at this great loss of opportunity for many an 
honest shilling might have been turned ere winter by the hire of my boat to him when he came out with me fishing i had prepared a scale of charges very little over captain bobs to whom he used to pay four pence an hour when i let him come after the whiting with me and now for no more than sixpence an hour he should have my very superior boat and keep her head by my directions for he understood a rudder and bait my hooks and stow my fish and enjoy as all boys should the idea of being useful for as concerns that little barky i had by this time secured myself from any further uneasiness or troublesome need of concealment by a bold and spirited facing of facts which deserve the congratulation of all honest fishermen the boat like her little captain was at first all white as i may have said but now before her appearance in public i painted her gunwale and strakes bright blue even down to her watermark and then without meddling with her name or rather that of the ship she belonged to i retraced very lightly but so that any one could read it the name of the port from which she hailed and which as i felt certain now from what i had seen on the poor wrecked ship must have been san salvador and the three last letters were so plain that i scarcely had to touch them now this being done and an old worn painter shipped instead of the new one which seemed to have been chopped off with an axe i borrowed a boat and stood off to sea from porth call point where they beached them having my tackle and bait on board as if for an evening off the tuscar where turbo and whiting pollock are here i fished until dusk of the night and as long as the people ashore could see me but as soon as all was dark and quiet i just pulled into newton bay and landed opposite the old red house where my new boat lay in ordinary snug as could be and all out of sight for the ruins of this old red house had such a repute for being haunted ever since a dreadful murder cast a ban around it that even i never wished to stop longer than need be there at night and once or twice i heard a noise that went to the marrow of my back of which however i will say no more until it comes to the proper place enough that no man woman or child for twenty miles round except myself had a conscience clear enough to go in there after dark and scarcely even by daylight my little craft was so light and handy that with the aid of the rollers ready i led her down over the beach myself and presently towed her out to sea with the water as smooth as a duck pond and the tide of the neap very silent the weather was such as i could not doubt being now so full of experience therefore i had no fear to lie in a very dangerous berth indeed when any cockle of a sea gets up or even strong tides are running this was the western fork of the tuscar making what we call callipers for the back of the tuscar dries at half ebb and a wonderful ridge stops the run of the tide not only for weeds but for fish as well here with my anchor down i slept as only a virtuous man can sleep in the grey of the morning i was up ere the waning moon was done with and found the very thing to suit me going on delightfully the heavy dew of autumn rising from the land by perspiration spread a cloud along the shore a little mist was also crawling on the water here and there and having slept with a watch-coat and tarpaulin over me i shook myself up without an ache and like a good bee at the gate of the hive was brisk for making honey hence i pulled away from land with the heavy boat towing the light one and even sandy macraw unable to lay his gimlet eye on me and thus i rowed until quite certain of being over three miles from land then with the broad sun rising nobly and for a moment bowing till the white fog opened avenues i spread upon my pole a shirt which mother jones had washed for me it was the time when sandy macraw was bound to be up to his business and i had always made a point of seeing that he did it to have a low fellow of itchy character and no royal breed about him thrust by a feeble and reckless government into the berth that by 
nature was mine and to find him not content with this but even in his hours of duty poaching both day and night after my fish and when i desired to argue with him holding his tongue to irritate me satisfaction there could be none for it the only alleviation left me was to rout up this man right early and allow him no chance of napping therefore i challenged him with my shirt thus early in the morning because he was bound to be watching the world if he acted up to his nasty business such as no seaman would deign to and after a quarter of an hour perhaps very likely it was his wife that answered at any rate there was a signal up and through my spy-glass i saw that people wanted to launch a boat but failed therefore i made a great waving of shirt as much as to say extreme emergency have the courage to try again expecting something good from this they laid their shoulders and worked their legs and presently the boat was bowing on the gently fluted sea now it was not that i wanted help for i could have managed it all well enough but i wanted witnesses for never can i bear to seem to set at naught legality and these men were sure upon half a crown to place the facts before the public in an honest manner so i let them row away for the very lives of them as if the salvage of the nation hung upon their thumbs and elbows only i doused my shirt as soon as i found them getting eager and i thought that they might as well hail me first and slope off disappointment hoy there boat ahoy what old davy llewellyn what man had a right to call me old there i was as fresh as ever and i felt it the more that the man who did it was grey on the cheeks with a very large family and himself that vile old sandy nevertheless i preserved good manners ship your starboard oars you lubbers do you want to run me down what the devil brings you here at this time of the morning hereupon these worthy fellows dropped their oars from wonder until i showed them their mistake and begged them to sheer off a little for if i had accepted ropes such as they wished to throw me they might have put in adverse claims and made me pay for my own boat when a poor man has been at work all night said i to break off their officiousness while all you lazy galley rakers were abed and snoring can't he put his shirt to dry without you wanting to plunder him to temper off what might appear a little rude though wholesome i now permitted them to see a stoneware gallon full of beer or at least i had only had two pints out finding this to be the case and being hot with rowing so rapidly to my rescue they were well content to have some beer and drop all further claims and as i never can bear to be mean i gave them the two and sixpence also sandy macraw took all this money and i only hoped that he shared it duly and then as he never seemed at all to understand my contempt of him he spoke in that dry drawl of his which he always droned to drive me into very dreadful words and then to keep his distance i am heartily glad maman to see the look ye have encountered never shall ye say again that i have the advantage of ye the boit stud me in mickle siller but ye have grappled a boit for it nort i cannot write down his outlandish manner of pronouncing english nor will i say much more about it because he concealed his jealousy so that i had no enjoyment of it except when i reasoned with myself and i need have expected nothing better from such a self-controlling rogue but when we came to porthcall point where some shelter is from wind and two public-houses and one private the whole affair was so straightforward and the distance of my boat from shore at time of capture so established and so witnessed that no steward of any manner durst even cast sheep's eyes at her a paper was drawn up and signed and the two public-houses at my expense christened her old davy and indeed for a little spell i had enough to do with people who came at all hours of the day to drink the health of my boat and me many of whom seemed to fail to remember really who was the one to pay and being still in cash a little and so generous always i found a whole basket of whiting and three large conjures and a lobster disappear against chalk marks whereof i had no warning and far worse no flavour 
but what i used to laugh at was that when we explained to one another how the law lay on this question and how the craft became legally mine as a derelict from the andalusia drifting at more than a league from land all our folk being short and shallow in the english language took up the word and called my boat all over the parish by relict as if in spite of the creator's wisdom i were dead and my wife alive End of chapter nineteen